Hey everybody, my name is Clyde and in today's video we are going to talk about everyone's favorite algorithm in World of Warships. That's right, we're going to talk about how matchmaking works, specifically the matchmaker for random battles. Now, today's video is very technical and very nerdy. It might be too nerdy for you and if that happens, don't worry about it, that's okay, but it is a really, really deep dive into the data behind matchmaking. We're gonna look at many, many charts and graphs which I've prepared to help explain what happens every single time we hit the battle button. And then I'm gonna talk through a few deficiencies in the matchmaker and propose a few ways that Wargaming could choose to address them, including some reasons why they probably won't. Then, finally, we'll talk through the concept of skill-based matchmaking. This is something that the player base has been clamoring for for literally years, but honestly, are we sure that's what we really want? We're going to talk through both sides of that discussion a little later in the video. Let's get started. The matchmaker in World of Warships is kind of a big deal. It's the gateway that gets you from port into a battle, and while that might seem like a simple job, it is anything but. About two years ago, Wargaming put out this video, which explains in very high detail how the matchmaker works. And honestly, it's really, really well done. It explains what factors Wargaming does and does not look at when creating a match. I've created a little infographic that I'll use to help explain the matchmaker in brief, but if you want all the gory details, you've got to go watch Wargaming's video, and I'll put a link to it in this video's description. In the most basic of terms, these are the steps for matchmaking. You assemble your division of friends, or not, and you hit the battle button. Your ship is then placed into what Wargaming calls a battle tier basket, which are essentially just groups of ships that could fight one another based on tier restrictions. The system does not consider a ship's modules, mounted upgrades, consumables, or whatever commander skills you have set. Only the ship's type, and its tier are taken into account. Once the baskets have enough ships to create a full 24 player match, those players are taken out of queue. And then the matchmaker performs a final balancing operation where it balances ships within a class by nation if possible. This is done to prevent one team from having say four Japanese destroyers and another from having four Soviet destroyers. This doesn't always work out because things like divisions don't allow final balancing to have complete freedom, but at least an attempt is made. As a quick side note, there are a lot of rules to matchmaking, and many of these change based on how long some ships have been waiting in the baskets unmatched. This video is not going to talk about queue dumps or how the matchmaker relaxes its rule enforcement over time. I do think this is a really interesting topic, but there's not a ton of details available about how the rules are relaxed. So today we're just going to focus on the general case. Next, a map is selected that is appropriate for the battle tier, and then you start loading into the match. This all sounds simple enough, of course, but that's because I skipped a whole bunch of publicly available details. There are undoubtedly countless edge cases and complicated bits that are known only to the software developers who maintain the code that implements this algorithm. It's all quite complicated, so if you want all the technical details, go watch that How It Works video. One more note about the matchmaker is that it's important to remember there are multiple different matchmakers. Brawls, ranked, clan battles all have different matchmakers than random battles, and this video is only going to focus on random battle matchmaking. By the way, this is not the first video I've made on this topic, so if you like this one, you'd probably also like this video over here. It's all about matchmaking fairness across the tiers, and it also investigates whether or not being in a division makes your matchmaking worse. I'll put a link to that video in this video's description as well. So now we know how the random matchmaker works. What's wrong with it? There has to be something wrong with it. There must be, because players are always complaining about it. I mean, there's a perception among players that the matchmaker isn't fair, or perhaps better worded that the matchmaker isn't fair enough. This is because a lot of WoWs players are obsessed with their stats and we watch those numbers like crazy. I'm one of those players. I'm extremely average at World of Warships. I'm unexceptional, <laughs> unexceptional in every way, but I'm that guy. I love my numbers. We've all been in a battle where some joker named XXX underscore battle bruiser 420 blazon 69 underscore XXX launches into all chat at the beginning of the match and says, GG Reds, our carrier sucks or our destroyers suck. Matchmaker has chosen for you to win this battle. And then they immediately shove their cur first right in the middle of the B cap with corks in their main battery, never firing a shot and proceeding to get burned down immediately by the enemy. At least Battle Bruiser 420 Blazon 69 made sure that he was right. Tool bag. 
But here at Clyde Plays HQ, we live and die by the maxim, never give up, never surrender. Never give up, never surrender. Oh, oh, shut up. All players should always play to win every single game. That's just good sportsmanship, and no one ever improved their skills by giving up when they were faced with a challenging opponent. I believe that any player can have an amazing game or a terrible game, regardless of their historical performance. Simultaneously, I do believe that players with better than average stats over the long term have a demonstrated ability to influence the outcomes of the games they play in for the better. That's just how math works. Finally, I believe that all players who take the time to study the game, think about the outcomes resulting from their actions, and critically take responsibility for those actions, can learn from their mistakes and improve their performance in this game. So what does all this have to do with the matchmaker? As we said earlier, whether it is true or not, many players share a belief that the matchmaker is not fair. This leads to a common request for a skill-based matchmaking system. Even I have asked for this in a few sort of embarrassing tweet threads from a while back. You can check these out on my Twitter account at Clyde Plays Games, or you can just avoid this area entirely, and that would be fine. Wargaming, of course, has long brushed off this suggestion, stating that adding matchmaking complexity would result in longer queue times, which are ultimately undesirable for the health of the game. I tend to think that Wargaming is right when they say that adding longer queue times is bad for the game, so I have a few questions. First, as players, how do we know that the matchmaker isn't fair? Can we even prove it? Or are we just suffering from confirmation bias? Put another way, how often does the matchmaker's current behavior result in imbalanced games with easily predictable results? And along those same lines, which readily accessible performance indicator is the best way for us to predict the result of a random battle? In order to answer these questions, I collected screenshots of matchmaking data and battle results from 333 different random battles across many different tiers. Then I took all this data and I entered it into a big old spreadsheet. I know I need to automate all of this and write some code, but I just have not taken the time to do it. If you have some tools that could help with this, let me know in the comments below, because I would rather not do this manually ever again. Then I created a whole bunch of charts and graphs based on the source data, as well as some data derived from the screenshots that isn't directly calculated for us by either Wargaming or WoW's monitor. Nothing I did in this video was particularly complicated, so it should be fairly easy to follow as we go throughout the video. I hope. As with any data set, this one has some minor issues that some of you math lords may take issue with. So in the interest of full disclosure, I just want to list everything I can think of that you might say, hey, this data is not good enough. So here goes. First of all, the data set is kind of small. Um, it's only 333 battles. More would certainly be better, but collecting and aggregating all of that data takes a lot of effort. So for this sort of collection, we're going to have to go with these 300 or so battles. Um, one day we'll automate more of this so that we can do this a little bit more intelligently, or I'll make friends with some of the nerds who run the websites about World of Warships out there and see if they'll give me some data. Um, second, I'm a player in every one of these battles, and that means that every battle has at least one team that has a constant in it, me. Now, as far as skill, I am pretty average, so I think that impact is probably negligible. I don't think I would have skewed the teams higher or lower by a significant margin. Um, if I were a super unicum player or a really new player who doesn't really know how to play World of Warships at all, this would be worse for the data set. But my solo win rate is 51.38%, and my overall random win rate in divisions and everything else is 53.31%. So I'm pretty in the middle. Um, plus, I'm not comparing the stats of individual players. This study is about the performance of entire teams, so I am only one of 12 people on my team in most cases. Obviously, we had some queue dumps and some smaller matches as well, but most matches had 12 players. Um, a possible secondary concern is that this study contains matches that only occur at the tiers that I choose to play, which may or may not reflect your own playstyle. I do play matches from tiers 5 through 10, with the occasional super ship match, and on very rare occasions, a match below tier 5. 
Among all these battles, most were captured on the NA server, with a very small number of them being played over on EU. So they may or may not reflect some of the subtleties of your particular server unless you also play on NA. I don't suspect this is a major concern, although the popularity of certain ships does differ somewhat from server to server, and so there could be some extremely minor differences in the matchmaking. But again, I'm not sure that I think that's a big deal. As far as I know, the base XP on the battle screen still takes into account whether or not a player has premium time. This is an old, long-standing problem. Um, if it has changed and you know about it and have a source for Wargaming, let me know in the comments below. But what that means is that players with premium are going to have a higher base XP value than those who do not. As a result, comparing the XP values of individual players is kind of impossible unless you know if they're a premium time player or if they're a free-to-play player. However, as I said, the study is concerned with the performance of entire teams, not individuals. And so across all 12 players on each team, I'm making the assumption that each team probably has approximately the same number of players that have premium and not premium um, and so that's a negligible thing that kind of cancels itself out. Okay, I think that is all of the issues uh, for the data set that I can think of. If you think of any more, let me know in the comments. Next, let's look at some basics from the data set. As I already said, there were 333 battles in the study, and because there are two teams in every battle, that means there are 666 teams. I guess I should have played one more battle. Uh, the average team win rate in their current ship is 50.27%, and the average win rate of a team based on their account win rates is 50.3%. I found that really interesting just because a team, when you get 12 players together and you average them, is just above 50%. So that was just kind of neat. The study includes battles as low as tier 3 and as high as tier 11, super ship matches. For the video, whenever I talk about the tier of a match, by the way, I'm referring to the tier of the highest ship in the match, not the tier of my ship in the battle, because I don't matter, I'm just a member of a team. To help characterize the data in the study a little bit better, this chart shows how many games were played at each battle tier in the study. As you can see, most of my games, 79.9% .9 of my battles, are at battle tier 8 and above, with only 67 battles taking place at battle tier 7 or below. Okay, so let's agree on some vocabulary. WoW's monitor provides us with six values that describe each team's performance. I call these battle performance indicators, or just indicators for short. They are average ship base XP, average ship win rate, average battle count in ship, average account base XP, average account win rate, and average account battle count. Although I had my own suspicions because I did this same study privately back in like 2017, I wanted to prove with data which indicator was the best at predicting the outcome of a battle. If we know the best way to predict the outcome of a battle, we can use that value to determine if the matchmaker is making balanced matches effectively. And maybe, just maybe, we can use this knowledge to help the matchmaker make better matches. But which indicator is best? Some players might hypothesize that the team with the better average base XP in their current ship would win. After all, they have a better history of performance in their current ship than the enemy team does. Similarly, somebody could suggest that the team with a better average account win rate will win because they win more games than their opponents do. It could also be argued that the team with the most battles in their current ship might be the best, or maybe the most battles on their account because they simply have more experience in World of Warships. For each of my battles, I captured whether or not each indicator agreed with the result of that battle. If the team with the better indicator value won the match, it means that the indicator agreed with the result, or in other words, the indicator correctly predicted who was going to win the match. If, on the other hand, the team with the better indicator lost the match, then that indicator was wrong about who would win the match. Does this make sense? I really hope so, because this is a video, it's a one-way communication medium. If it doesn't make any sense, join the Clyde Plays Discord if you're not already a member and ask me questions in there. I will try my best to answer them. Uh, link in the description for anybody who's not already a member. Here we can see each of the six indicators across all battles in all tiers of the data set. They're paired by color, with base XP being blue, win rate being green, and battle count being red. The three left bars, the ones on the left side that is, are based on the player's current ship, and the three bars on the right 
are account-based indicators. Interestingly, but perhaps unsurprisingly, the account-based indicators each outperformed their ship-based counterparts. The average battle count in ship seems to be the worst indicator of a match's result. It only correctly predicted the outcome of a match 46.55% of the time. The average account win rate correctly predicted the match outcome by 70.57% of the time. Now, you'd be forgiven if you stopped right here and just assumed that average account win rate was the best indicator of team performance. However, you would be wrong. And if you stick with me, I'm gonna show you why. So this first graph is based on doing a very simple check. Did the winning team have a higher or lower score for a given indicator? Now, while it's not inaccurate per se, it is a bit of a, a blunt instrument. A more elegant solution would be to look at the gap between the indicator values of the winning and losing teams. For example, if one team had an account win rate that's about 1% better than the other, how often would the team with the better account win rate win the battle? What if that account win rate gap was 2%? What if it was 6%? How much more often does the win rate indicator predict the winning team as the gap between their account win rates increases? In theory, the wider the gap in skill indicator, the more likely the team with the better indicator is going to win the battle. Does that make sense? I mean, if all of this sounds complicated, I swear it's actually not too bad. So let's look at some example graphs that show what a good indicator looks like and what a bad indicator looks like. First, we'll look at a good indicator. In this graph, the blue bars represent how often the team with the higher historical performance won the battle. Bars farther to the right on the graph represent a wider gap between the two teams' performance. For example, if this chart was about win rate, the first blue bar might represent gaps of 1% whereas the far right bar might represent a 14% win rate gap. The taller the bar, the more likely it is the team with the higher performance indicator will win the game. Note the green line that traces the top of the blue bars. As we move to the right, the prediction accuracy increases steadily and consistently, which gives us confidence that this indicator becomes more and more accurate as the performance gap between the two teams increases. Now, of course, if this were a real graph, we would know that the indicator in this graph is a reliable predictor of battle outcome. Now we'll look at an example of a bad performance indicator graph. In this example, just like in the blue one, the red bars represent how often the team with the higher historical performance won the battle. However, unlike the previous graph, there doesn't seem to be any correlation between the increase in the gap of performance indicators and the match results. The green line goes up and it goes down instead of steadily increasing as we move from left to right. In other words, as the gap between the team's performance indicators increases, there doesn't seem to be an, uh, like a paired increase in match prediction accuracy. I would say that the indicator in this red chart is not reliable at predicting who will win a given battle. And if it were me, I'd stop using it. Okay, grab a piece of paper, grab a sticky note, a note card, whatever you have nearby, and write down which of these you think is the most reliable indicator of match result. Okay, hopefully you've locked in your hypothesis because we're gonna start looking at the graphs. This pair of charts shows the accuracy of the battle count in ship indicator. In other words, the number of battles that players on a team have in their current ship. There are two charts here. The top one is just like the example graphs that we just looked at, and it shows how accurate the indicator is at predicting match outcomes. The bottom one simply shows the number of battles in the study that are represented in each of the bars in the upper graph. For example, the first bar on the left of the lower chart indicates that the study had 185 battles where the difference between the two teams' battle counts in their current ship was 100 or less. This chart shows that the number of battles the team has in their current ship is a really poor indicator. In fact, what's kind of impressive is that over those 185 battles that had a gap of zero to 100, the indicator only correctly pre predicted the battle outcome 43.78% of the time. A person guessing completely randomly with no input data at all should be able to hit 50-50. And if we imagine our green line running across the top of those bars, it is not very steady at all. This is not a good indicator of team performance. When we look at the gap in account battles, it's a little bit better because there is at least a general upward trend, but the path is quite uneven with lots of ups and downs. Due to the large variance in the numbers of games between player accounts, however, we do see that the matches are more distributed across the different bands which represent the indicator gaps between the two teams. 
Basically, this graph tells us something that I think most of us already knew intrinsically. Just because you play a lot of World of Warships does not mean you are particularly good at it. The ability to influence battles in WoWs does not come from simply logging in and hitting the battle button over and over and over again. Most people don't get good at warships on accident. It takes concerted practice. So the number of average account battles is not a good indicator of team performance either. Let's check out the next one. This graph is all about win rate in current ship as a performance indicator. Now, one thing that absolutely blew my mind is I had not one, but two battles served up to me by the matchmaker where the average win rate in ship of the two teams was 16% apart. I found like, I found that to be insane that that would ever even happen, but it did. Now, as far as being a valid predictor of battle performance, things look a little bit better here. There is an obvious upward slope for the green bars in the upper graph. Although the data isn't perfectly smooth, I mean, there are a few ups and downs. And while the reason this is a better indicator is not exactly clear from the data itself, I think we can make some educated guesses as to why. Earlier, I said that I believe that players with long histories of higher than average win rates are better able to influence their battles for victory than others. Looking at the upper graph here, it seems like that's also true for teams of players with better than average win rates in their current ship. If we take all of the matches with a 5% or greater gap in ship win rate, the team with the better win rate takes home the victory 75% of the time. Now, while this is easily the best performance indicator we've looked at so far, it is in the middle of my list, so this can't possibly be the best one. Let's keep going. In all 333 battles in this study, I never saw an account win rate gap greater than 8%. In fact, almost 59% of the battles I played had a team win rate gap of 2% or less when it comes to account win rates. And remember, this happens by random happenstance because we know the matchmaker does not take into account past player performance when it's putting together a team. Similar to ship win rate, account win rate tends to have an obvious and steady upward trend as we move from left to right in the graph. As before, we do have some variability, but all in all, account win rate is a pretty reliable metric. It's based upon a player's entire performance history, which could be thousands of battles in hundreds of different ships. That is, unless the player requested a stat reset, which is, I mean, it's whatever. Compared to ship win rate, however, gaps in account win rate are much, much, much more significant when it comes to predicting a team's performance. Remember that for ship win rate, a gap of 5% or more resulted in a correct battle outcome prediction 75% of the time. For account win rate, the results of a battle with a 5% gap is correctly predicted 93.3% of the time. In fact, a difference in team account win rate of just 2% is a better predictor than a ship win rate gap of 5%. Essentially, what we've confirmed here, again, is something that many of us already knew in our gut. Account win rate is a more accurate representation of a team's performance than ship win rate. And by extension, it's a better predictor of a team's future performance. Now, of course, account win rate is not a perfect metric on a player by player basis. We've all bumped into a player who's got 5,000 battles in Fujin or maybe Julio Cesare who's farmed up a 65% account win rate, even though they don't perform particularly well in any other ship. Now, I wanna make it clear, I am not here to yuck anyone's yum. We should never use a player's statistics to make fun of them or tease them. Um, I want you to go, go out there, log into World Warships and have fun whatever way you can and whatever way you want to. But it's clear that someone who has a 65% win rate across many different ships of many different varying power levels has more ability to influence a match than someone who can only do so in a single ship or maybe even a few ships that are known to be very powerful. So account win rate is a decent predictor across the span of a team, particularly as the gap grows wider. But as I told you earlier, it's not the best one. Next, we'll check out the graph for a team's average base XP in their current ships. It's arguable if this graph is better or worse than the last one we just looked at for account win rate, but I think it's at least as good. The blue bars increase as we move to the right nice and smoothly, and although we do have a little dip about two thirds of the way across, those bars still represent a 73 and 75% match prediction accuracy. And that's actually pretty good. Base XP is a metric that includes points for the sum of all of your in-battle actions. Wargaming rewards us for doing things that they think win games. From a certain point of view, it's actually multiple metrics rolled into one. So what I told you was true, from a certain point of view. It really feels like we're getting close to finding the best metric, right? This chart right here is the GOAT. Look at this graph. 
as we move from left to right. That is, as we move from small gaps in average team account base XP, it's kind of a mouthful, to larger and larger gaps, we see a nearly perfectly steady increase in the performance indicator's accuracy. Yes, it's a little bit stair-steppy, but the values almost always go up, only going down one time. The larger the gap in account base XP, the easier it is for the team with the higher score to win, and the harder it is for the underdog to overcome their disadvantage. It doesn't take much gap for this problem to start to be statistically significant. I'm just leaving that in, that was hard to say. When we look at uh, matches that have a gap of account base XP of 51 or higher, the team with the larger value wins 75.3% of the time. That's huge. And that sort of gap is not uncommon at all. 251 of my 333 games had that sort of gap or larger. That's like 75% of the games I played. Okay, I wanna show you some different charts real quick. And I hope that if you made it this far in the video, you're not tired of charts. There's like no way if you made it this far that you're tired of charts. In fact, if you made it this far, go down into the comments and say, I am not tired of charts. Um, okay, uh, these are three new charts that basically grab the account metrics for teams uh, for battle count, win rate, and average base XP. Except for this time, I made the bars cumulative instead of each only covering a narrow range of gaps. Doing this has the effect of smoothing out the graphs and showing a bit more accurately how the indicators gain accuracy as the gap increases, or not as the case may be. I'm looking at you, battle count. Note how smooth the increase is for account base XP. That's the blue one right above my head. Win rate is still pretty good over here in the green, but it is less steady and predictable as the gap increases than base XP is. And of course, battle count over here, completely bananas. Okay, whatever Clyde, great. So now we know which metric is the best for predicting match outcomes. What do we do with that information? How does that help us make Matchmaker better? Let's talk about two problems that I see in the data and one problem that players often complain about. The first problem is that small average XP gaps give one team a statistically significant advantage. Once the average XP gap exceeds 50, it becomes very difficult for the lower skill team to overcome the random whim of the matchmaker. What happens when the gap gets above 150? In that situation, there's an 81.6% chance that you already know who's going to win the game as soon as you spawn in. Gaps above 150 are also not very uncommon. In my study, they happened about 38% of the time. Now, remember, we never give up, we never surrender, and we play every game to its fullest because that's good sportsmanship, and that's how you get better at World of Warships. However, I would prefer it if the matchmaker had a little bit less to say about who was going to win the match. The second problem is that very large XP gaps make for unwinnable scenarios for the underdogs. In my data, once the average account XP gap exceeded 350, the team with the higher average XP won the game 100% of the time. In this study, there were 22 such battles, and every single time, the team with the better score took home the win. Luckily, that sort of gap only occurs 6.6% .6 of the time, at least in this study. However, in my opinion, even though it doesn't happen very often, that should never be allowed to happen. That big of a skill gap is simply unacceptable. The third problem I want to mention is the one that players talk about a lot, steamrolls. Now, defining what a steamroll is isn't easy, but you know one when you see one. For this study, I defined a steamroll as a game in which the winning team had seven more surviving ships than the losing team. That definition is imperfect and it's flawed, but it's probably good enough for our purposes. To be clear, a steamroll doesn't mean that the winning team has seven surviving ships. It means they have seven more ships than the losing team. I chose this value after making a chart that showed the gap between the number of surviving ships for winning and losing teams. For example, a scenario where the winning team has eight surviving ships and the losing team has two at the end of a battle would not qualify as a steamroll. As you can see, the most common gap in surviving ship count between winners and losers is six ships. So I figured that a steamroll would be on the high side of that. In this data set, steamrolls, as I've defined them, happen 24.32% of the time. Is that too many? 
I mean, honestly, I don't know, but it seems like plenty to me. As a side note, this graph shows that 3% of battles are considered upsets. Uh, for this chart, I define an upset to be when the winning team has fewer ships than the losing team. Here's a couple more charts for you number nerds if you want to take a look at the frequency of surviving ship counts for both the winning and losing teams. The top one shows how frequently each number of surviving ships occurred for the winning team, and the bottom one shows the same data but for the losing team. Interestingly, if you split that orange graph into just four sections, we can see that it's more likely that the winning team has six or fewer ships at the end of a battle. If this graph were more top heavy instead of bottom heavy, it would indicate that the winning teams were winning by larger margins. So as you can see, both the one through three ship bar is larger than the 10 through 12 ship bar, and the four through six ship bar is larger than the seven through nine ship bar. That's actually kind of encouraging. And I have to imagine that balancing a, sh a game like this so that steam rolls happen less often is really, really delicate. So good news is the surviving ship counts are closer to non-steamrolls than steamrolls, I guess. So I guess we should totally just go fix all these issues, yeah? I mean, doesn't the community deserve a skill-based matchmaker now that they know just how wacky the one we have can be? Well... What? <sighs> Frankly, I'm not sure the community hmm. really knows what they're asking for. What? I know you're the community. I know I'm the community. <laughs> but let's say that Wargaming snapped their magical little fingers and all of a sudden, we had a perfect skill-based matchmaker. A perfect skill-based matchmaker would place players into cohorts based on their skill and pit those players against one another. As a result, present-day low-skill players would see an increase in their win rates because they would no longer have to play against Super Unicum Uber Chads. Present-day high-skill players, those Super Unicum Uber Chads I just mentioned, would all see their stats reduced. They would never again have the same level of influence over a battle that they have today. They would have to play against players in their own league 100% of the time. The long and the short of it is, lower skill players would see their stats come up, and higher skill players would see their stats go down, and players who existed in small cohorts, either the highest or lowest skilled players probably, would likely have long queue times. Skill-based matchmaking reduces the influence of individual players, good or bad, by balancing the competition on the team. A well-implemented skill-based matchmaker would result in making it more difficult for one or two players to carry a team to victory. Is that what we really want? Good guess, but actually no. We still want a little bit of chaos. We still want some hard carrying. We still want to have stories to tell, some crazy plays, Hail Mary passes, unbelievable pushes that never should have worked right up the middle of two brothers. Sure, some of that would still happen in a skill-based matchmaking system, but probably not as frequently. So what do we do now? Well, Wargaming has told us countless times they don't want to change the matchmaker because increasing queue times is unhealthy for the game, and that would be a result of skill-based matchmaking. And I think they're right. Increasing the queue times would be bad for the game, and I do not want them to do that. However, I am a person who works with software developers. I am a software developer, and coders will always tell you that everything is impossible until you ask them enough questions. Or maybe until you ask them the right question. I believe there is a way to insert some skill-based matchmaking intelligence without increasing our queue times significantly. And I also believe that we don't want to apply too much skill-based matchmaking to the current algorithm because we like a little bit of crazy. If I was the lord of matchmaking for a day, this is what I would do. I would only apply skill-based matchmaking information to battles that had more than an average account XP gap of 201. Maybe we would actually call this skill-based match rebalancing. More on this in a second. In my data set, this change would only kick in for 72 battles. That's 21.6% of the battles in the data set. In those 72 battles, the underdog lost the game 87.5% of the time. So making this change would, would try to target the most egregiously poorly balanced games, but still allow plenty of wild and crazy matches to slip through and give us stories to tell our friends at work the next day. Remember that matchmaking infographic that showed kind of the workflow from when you hit the battle button to when you're in a match? Right after final balancing, where they swap ships from team to team based on a combination of ship class and nationality, I've added a purple box. Inside this processing step, 
the algorithm could look at the players assigned to each team and swap around a few just to reduce the gap in the team's average base XP to an acceptable level. Now, obviously we're using average base XP because those are the values that we have from Matchmaking Monitor. Wargaming has better data than this. They know what data they would need to use and Wargaming, if you're watching, just use that, whatever the best data is. But this is where you could do it. Critically, this step occurs after the complex matchmaking algorithm has already created a match with 24 players. I am not recommending that the matchmaker include skills in its match basket creation. Doing so would be incredibly messy, would add complexity to an already complicated process, and would make it very difficult to test and probably much, much slower. Don't do that, that's terrible. My proposal is a relatively quick check and a subtle team reshuffling operating on a pre-selected set of 24 data elements, the players who are in the game, which for a computer is an incredibly small set of data. The algorithm would be very fast, although it would still have to respect things such as divisions, so it wouldn't be able to create a perfect matchup, but I believe we could always make it better. Okay, problem solved, right? Clyde has saved the day. Well, no, actually I haven't. First of all, this idea I've proposed, there's literally no way that someone at Wargaming hasn't already had this idea and proposed it internally. It's not that novel of an idea, and it's modeled after a matchmaking rebalancing step that Wargaming already does, that class slash nationality final rebalancing step. I have absolutely no evidence that I'm right about that, but trust me, if I've already thought of this, they've already thought of this. Second. Wargaming doesn't ask me for coding advice, and honestly, they shouldn't. The software systems that I work on have users too, and while my users have a lot of great ideas, they are not in charge of the direction of my development team and their efforts. From my own professional experience, users make a lot of feature requests, and there are often very good reasons why we don't just drop everything and start working on the things that they're asking for. So why, after years and years of players asking for improved matchmaking, has Wargaming done nothing about it? I believe it comes down to two things. First, I speculate that the matchmaking algorithm doesn't currently have access to player performance data, and getting it would be slow or complicated. Database queries are some of the slowest things in computer science, and asking the matchmaker to do that mid-operation could be inefficient. I'd probably mitigate this by having the client fetch that data from the server when you log in and using the same performance data element throughout your entire gaming session. Um, your overall skill probably wouldn't change much during a single game session, so this would probably work well enough for our purposes. Second, and some of you may argue with me on this, but you would be wrong, the matchmaker is probably the single most important algorithm in the game. It is more important than anything graphically, it is more important than shell ballistics, it is more important than whether or not Leone gets ASW, it is more important than everything that you're thinking about right now. If a serious bug was introduced that prevented the player base's ability to get into a match, everyone would lose their minds. Well, then everyone loses their minds! This is the equivalent of Amazon making a major change to the shopping cart that prevented you from ordering that new iPhone case you've been eyeballing, or that made the shopping cart so slow you had to wait in line at Amazon. Remember how you wait in line at Amazon? No, you never wait in line at Amazon. Ever. Plus, this algorithm has probably largely been untouched for years. The devs who wrote it might not even work for Lesta or Wargaming anymore. And if they do, they probably work for Lesta. As a software development leader myself, I would not ask my brand new software team to dig into some of the oldest code in my product without a subject matter expert who really knows their way around the code. Especially if it was the most important algorithm in my game. All right, so that's it. That's the video on matchmaking. Believe me, this video is super long and there was so much more I wanted to say, but I didn't. Wargaming, I think we can make it a little bit better. I really do. I hope you guys were actually watching. That'd be hilarious and amazing and cool. But like, seriously guys, I think we can make it a little bit better. We don't have to make it perfect, but we can fix the worst of it. And I, if you decide to try it, you guys are legends. And if you don't, I understand. 
So uh, people, what did you think? Go down into the comments, let me know what you think. Give me your ideas. What would we do to make a better matchmaker? Maybe your ideas are crap and maybe they're amazing, but we're gonna find out. And I'm gonna try to respond to as many of them as I can. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. I hope that you made it this far. This is, again, this, I haven't edited this yet, but it's gonna be a very long one, I can already tell. Um, so thank you a ton for watching the video if you got this far. Tell a friend if you think this is interesting, post it on the forums, post it in discords, let people know about it. Thank you a ton for watching. Please take care of each other, be cool, be nice. Come see us on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Clyde Plays Live. And until we catch you next time, take care and be cool.